most of the manufacturers are reacting to the downstream. They never talk enough about how they are changing the product upstream. What is coming up in the pipeline? Welcome to the Smarter Building Materials Marketing Podcast, helping you find better ways to grow leads, sales, and outperform your competition. All right, everybody, welcome to Smarter Building Materials Marketing, where we believe your online presence should be your best salesperson. I am Zach Williams, and we have a great guest on the show with us today. We have Mahesh Ramanajam, who's the president and CEO at Global Network for Zero, on the podcast with us today. Mahesh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Zach, for having me, and it's great to be with you today. Mahesh, you are, and I'm going to put you on the spot, you are halfway across the world. Is that right? It's like 9.30 your time. (laughs) And you just told me like you work with people, yeah, you work with people like East Coast time as well, right? You're working around the clock. Yes, yes. I'm I'm super impressed. I think this is like the latest we've ever interviewed somebody. So thank you for being very committed. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So for our listeners, just give us a little bit of a background on who you are, Mahesh, and what your organization does. Uh, As you rightly pointed out, I'm the president and CEO of Global Network for Zero, and where we convene a coalition of leaders dedicated to progressing society towards ESG compliance and ultimately a zero emissions world. So our primary focus, if you really get to the actions that we want to do, which is to digitize climate action by doing two things. One, either through developing cutting-edge breakthrough new technologies and solutions that will help to eliminate the market barriers to zero emissions, and also to help those who are on the ground tasked with implementing ESG and zero emission strategies. In in short, we are focused on implementation on the ground, and we are going to drive it through digital transformation. And then in addition to that, we also focus on education and connect all these implementers with existing best-in-class practices, technologies, and solutions that will help them to eventually make measurable progress. So personally, as an investor, convener, and unifier, I have a ton of experience in leading global technology platforms, and my passion is on integration and interoperability of various systems, because I believe that's the only way the sustainability sector can scale. Now, my experience is both in non-profit as well as for-profit sectors, and uh, I spent a lot of time uh, talking to businesses, communities, cities, buildings, infrastructure, and of course, uh, a variety of uh, uh, industries. Uh, to help them realize their ESG and net zero strategies, goals, and commitments. And before joining, before starting, I should say, before starting founding the Global Network for Zero, I was the president and CEO of US Green Building Council, Green Business Certification, Inc., and also the Global Technology Arc. And uh, there, I had the wonderful opportunity to lead the lead rating system, the world's uh, greenest rating system in the world. And uh, along with uh, a, a ton of community members around the world, I was able to future-proof the internationally recognized lead rating system with a more rigorous and ambitious certification process, one that included the overdue and necessary decarbonization requirements for a net zero reality. So technically, we set the foundation for Global Network of Zero while we were at US Green Building Council. And uh, that has been one of my uh, hallmark moments with lead and uh, working beyond lead. Of course, uh, during that time, uh, serving at USGBC for over 13 years, had the wonderful opportunity to bring a multiple groundbreaking programs that at this point of time are helping the society to realize sustainability, health and wellness, resilience, and equity. That is really, really impressive. Um, I was actually checking out your LinkedIn profile before our recording here. And my biggest question is like, you worked for what you just mentioned, like one of the largest, if not the largest green building, I mean, the green building council, you're the president and CEO. Um, I want to know like why you left and why did you start something that looks like, if I want to say it, like it looks like a competitor to it. I mean, if, you, if it can't if, if it can be a competitor, I mean, they're both not, it looks like they're nonprofits, but like, why did you go from one, one space to a, like, where you have a ton of influence to starting something completely new? So one of the foundational things I learned at USGBC was you never stop innovating, right? So in the building sector, we went from version one to version two, to version three, to version four. And then during my tenure, we got it even up to version 4.1. So perpetual innovation, perpetual continuous improvement is the hallmark of LEED, is the hallmark of US Green Building Council and its community. So what I realized was that potential, that opportunity need to be extended to other industries. So the charter of US Green Building Council is buildings, but I wanted to go from buildings to communities to cities. So if you go back and look at the, the last few years of my leadership there, I tried to expand buildings to communities to cities. Then I wanted to go into infrastructure. Then uh, as uh, you can 
rightly understand that I'm a, an impatient person. And particularly when it comes to climate change, I don't have a lot of patience in terms of us sitting on the sidelines. So I wanted to really get out there and take all this knowledge that I've developed at US Green Building Council and help the world. And what that means is that I boil it down to three steps. One, net less is critical. Net zero is essential, but net positive is the goal. And why I say that is because we can have net zero energy, net zero water, net zero waste, net zero carbon, but eventually it is about creating positive impact on people's health and wellness and well-being. So when you look at it from that perspective, the work that we can do from the learnings of the U.S. Green Building Council is powerful. Now, even while at U.S. Green Building Council, I never believed in the concept of competition because the work that we need to do is so huge. It's such a big social undertaking. So we cannot see anybody as competitors, but we have to see only everybody as a partners. So I always, I coined the term at U.S. Green Building Council as partnership is a new leadership. So definitely I'm not a competitor to U.S. Green Building Council, but here I am here to advocate for U.S. GBC and much more. And that's why uh, I decided to get out of that box and give that opportunity to my wonderful team that I built there and my colleagues who are doing a great job there. And then really transcend that leapfrog, the vision to really get obsessed about zero emissions work. That's what I want to commit my next decade of my life to. I like that. I like that partnership. That's that's a great answer. Um, and I respect the fact that you think that it's not a competitor, but if I'm looking at your resume, I'm like, wow, that's a heck of a change. <laughs> but I, 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 t I totally hear what you're saying. I think it makes sense. The question I have, if I'm a manufacturer and I'm listening to you, Mahesh, the idea of net zero, and I like how you broke down you know, what is required, what is necessary in those different steps. But for a lot of manufacturers, they're saying, hey, I'm going to develop, I'm going to create what the market demands and what the market wants. And so you are effectively pushing an idea forward in the marketplace with local communities, with builders, with contractors, those in construction architects. What are the, some of the things that you see that are going to impact manufacturers in the next 12 months, as well as let's say the next three to five years? Where are things heading in the space that you really have expertise? I believe that, you know, the, I would say that most of the manufacturers are very clearly savvy to know sustainability is no longer a a side act. Everyone has got a clear roadmap within their own supply chain or value chain to really embrace sustainability, to make their uh, materials more sustainable, healthy, and resilient. So it's not a new news for what I would say a savvy manufacturer or a manufacturer who is in the game. So this is not a new news for that leadership. But the challenge for them is emerging out of this pandemic, we are in this uh, ultra inflationary environment. Uh, there is an enormous market challenge that's happening from a financial point of view. So the challenge will be is how do you do trade-offs? The biggest challenge in the next 12 months, even I would argue for 24 months, is that manufacturers need to make a decision between doing the right thing and being able to survive. Because at the mm. end of the day, the market is going to demand better pricing, cheaper, faster, smarter. So that is always a challenge, particularly even at USGBC, we realize market transformation is a balancing act. So there is no shortcut. So my biggest worry for the manufacturers on behalf of the manufacturers is that how are they going to keep their good aspirations along with maintaining a healthy bottom line and most importantly preserving jobs because if if you do if you do things on the other side of the equation then you are really not sustainable or sustainability is coming at a price and cost which we don't want so i would say manufacturers should not side step the focus on sustainability this is the time to double down this is the time to really find creative ways to make this sustainable even even if it means that it's a little bit of premium and not be discouraged by the pushbacks from, that you get from the market but really advocate for it and push it and by the way clearly i recognize it's not an easy work it's hard work but the demand is there people are really looking at long term and then it's important that we remind covid as the most important marker in all these things so that is the first part the second part is that is nobody is going to escape the zero emissions directive Everybody needs to align to zero. Now, if you really look at it, even the United States, which was kind of a little bit confused for a, quite a longer time, recently passed the Inflationary Act, which means a ton of rebates, ton of money, ton of capital is going to flow. And I'm an optimist. I believe that in the next two quarters, money will turn around, value will be appreciated, and people who can deliver true value will survive. So I do believe that from that perspective, if they can integrate quality with 
the the philosophy of zero and really align and be precise about defining the business case delivering the value prop particularly in the context of the occupants of the building in this case then i think you will be able to identify yourself as a differentiated manufacturer and be able to sell your products faster smarter quicker now all of these things all of the people know but what i am reminding everybody is have conviction in what you are proposing do the right thing and you will win for the long term is there anyone that you can think of that's doing this well mahesh like is there a manufacturer you you hear that like you you know i don't know just even in conversation you say these guys are doing it the right way they're pushing back as you mentioned or they're really pushing the idea of net zero forward i believe i uh, not specifically net zero because net zero is kind of becoming a narrative i would put that under the category of sustainability health and wellness primarily so if you take air conditioning manufacturers there are some leading air conditioning manufacturers who are really doing this very well there are glass manufacturers there are uh, carpet manufacturers there are uh, tile manufacturers now i'm intentionally not naming particular people because i believe the industry itself has really raised the bar on itself right so when you look at them what they have done for the last 20 25 years they have been working on it that's not this is not something that was just done yesterday right they have been doing this for a long term they have been continuously improving their products they have been constantly keeping track of current regulations policies guidelines best practices and really institutionalize the practice of sustainability as an integrated practice as part of their manufacturing innovation and most importantly distribution so i i do believe those actors are really well ahead of the curve and they are one step away or two steps away from truly hitting the net zero goals for example some of the manufacturers are really net zero factories themselves meaning they have they are not only preaching uh to their product equation but they are also actually making sure the factories in which these products are generated are truly net zero now a couple of them around the world are already net zero factories for example you could you could uh, look at colgate palmolive colgate palmolive has got 13 lead platinum factories around the world they got their factories to be true zero based and today they are trying to push the agenda of really bringing a uh, net zero um, focus to their products by reducing plastic by reducing water by reducing the the consumption so that they can really consume less energy less water less materials less resources etc so this is just one example but but there are ton of examples in each of these industry verticals that i talked about and much more so so i am very encouraged by the fact that the manufacturers are 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 taking a long term approach to doing these things and the people who are on the sidelines can learn from them and grow quickly and most importantly replicate their strategies for their own good so that is that's my view point on that subject mahesh i was talking to an architect recently who i was just interviewing him for some market research and i was asking him like hey you know what goes into the decisions you make around the products that you use and he was telling me about this project that he's doing where he's really trying to go to that zero based product as you as you're talking about and i and i what i thought was interesting is he was sharing with me that he's like hey i really want to do this but i and he's someone who's in the field he's like i i don't know everything about this and there's obviously people who are specialized in it he's like but i'm trying to find products in these couple categories that can help my efforts to to move these different projects to a, a zero based implementation or zero based you know end result what i'm curious to get your take on is if i'm a manufacturer and i've got products or i'm trying to push this this different product development down the chain what are some things that you see that are working for manufacturers from a marketing perspective and a sales perspective to get these products and get the knowledge around their products in the hands of people that actually make decisions for projects whether that's an architect whether that's an end user or homeowner if it's commercial or even let's say the gc contractor builder since you're talking about building so much i'll give you my perspective from my prior job right although although my currently i am still evolving that concept what i've seen the greatest opportunity always existed for people was be it the lead rating system or the well rating system that's another uh, partner of us at usgbc uh, developed by the international well building institute and and the products like cradle to cradle you know the cradle to cradle certification i should say all these three things are kind of gold standards for you to really communicate the value proposition of your product itself so the first and foremost if i was a product manufacturer i would ask my team are you compliant with the lead version 4.1 are you compliant with the latest version of well are you really looking at the lead the sorry the c2c version 4 that's out there and and how are we performing 
with it or above it or or further than that you know these are three good starting points any manufacturer to start now once you know that compliance has been achieved then you have to articulate very clearly how you achieved it what is the benefit to the consumer or the occupant or the building owner particularly in the context of really accruing the benefits to the person itself for example i always say when you want to talk about buildings you have to talk about the people inside those buildings which means that particularly coming out of this covid again i'll underscore that how does it impact zack how does it help mahesh how does it impact the zack's family if you are able to clearly articulate the benefit of your product in the context of health and wellbeing of an individual then naturally people are going to connect with your product better and that's where i think i see a enormous amount of improvements people can make third is that celebrate the success stories of your products installation how certifications were obtained and how these products have helped certain categories of lead certification or well certification or for that matter the cradle to cradle certification be realized within the construct of the consumers this is an area that i have seen to be a little bit of a peak area for manufacturers i will see them come with brochures i'll see them come with even actually explaining the compliance but they will never talk about how their product actually helped a building or a city or a community to actually achieve the the x certification or a compliance or a regulation or whatever and i think that's because because it's a little bit of siloed effect the manufacturer are facing so from a marketing and communication perspective i always tell them why are you guys not talking about it particularly quantifying the benefits i mean it's not bad to talk about money because you know what is happening the biggest market transformation opportunity of a building comes from the materials the more you can clearly talk about <laughs> very clearly how much money did you save how much price did you quote and most importantly what does it mean to the long term implications in terms of the operational cost savings of that building or a city or a community wherever you are and most importantly what was the carbon footprint that you either contributed to it or you are awarded to it so there is a little bit of transparency a little bit of storytelling and lot of value and values proposition if you can do that it shouldn't be it shouldn't be rocket science for a good marketer it's a dream job for a marketer to basically put that out there and lead with it so i mean be, i believe that is the greatest opportunity for a manufacturer to really articulate that value proposition the other part is there is most of the manufacturers are reacting to the downstream they never talk enough about how they are changing the product upstream what is coming up in the I pipeline i love that right because because it's a reactionary process what one of the frustrations i had with the lead was i catch it too late then when i sit with the manufacturer i have to empathize empathize with them because they'll say mesh i got a million pieces of this inventory i had to move this first before i can drive transformation on that product i understand if i am a cfo i'll say sell that damn thing first what am i language <laughs> right <laughs> so the reality is you have to be pragmatic about these things but what you have to do is that is you have to start telling people these are the new technologies we are thinking about this is our intent this is where we are going these are the hardships we face this is where we cannot substitute the product or product substitution comes at a very cost prohibitive barrier now that will require a lot of understanding from consumers a lot of support and most importantly that transparency is also key last but not the least i always have to give a shout out my to my favorite show for greenbelt greenbelt is our annual conference for sustainability go and get a booth there and scream at the top of your voice and tell all the stories that you have because uh, this is the story you have to tell and that's where the story is told so that's my view okay so i want to talk about greenbelt really quickly uh, cuz you obviously know it intimately i've been to greenbelt a handful of times okay and one of the things i heard from manufacturers there individuals who were at booths is that there's a different level of degree of commitment that they would see to the green initiative and that the term green if you will it's something where you lump in like oh we care about the environment into this like green category and so mahesh i'm bringing this up not to you know poke at those manufacturers but more to get your take on if you want to talk the talk if you want to speak to architects or different audiences and really provide a solution that they're looking for how would you define that green or how would you define that in a way that will really really resonate with those audiences it has to be based on a standards framework right this is where they have to lean heavily on the standards and the certifications and the credentials that they've achieved right so i think that's basically where they have to start and most of the manufacturers do it if you go around greenbull most of the manufacturers would clearly show that they are compliant to a lead version 4.1 mrc credit that's a that's a easy lift for everybody but then they also don't sit with the people and try to understand where they think the barriers are where do they think that these 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 skepticism is coming 
and and really try to understand the needs and wants of those 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 architects right in this case if you are a specifier also also one of the things that nobody pushes back in the market is that to ask some question saying do you have a catalog of products that you have what products you typically substitute why do you substitute them why do you choose a particular product this is something that i've tried to even work with the architect community to say hey can we get a list of products and can you guys publish it out there so that we can actually go out and crowdsource it from all the manufacturers and say that this product oh, yeah, there's nowhere like, nowhere it's there go? nowhere no, it's there is it is this what you're going to do like you should do this someone should do this <laughs> yes like, no i, I tried all the time like i tried like, to I, Right. I, I was researching. I was researching uh, SIPs recently. Just like I went down a like a rabbit hole researching SIPs, and I found this one SIP company that they make all of their products from like, like they use like straw and hay, and they have like this zero emission promise. I mean, really cool. And they're based out of Europe. And I was like, this is really cool. Like, if I didn't like just stumble upon them on Instagram, like, how would I have found them online? So, if you're listening, if you're a manufacturer, somebody like likes this show. There is, I think, I don't know, Mahesh, I think there's demand for like a centralized catalog of like these clean or net zero, whatever you want to call it, building products um, so that architects and people can find them easily. And I, I encourage you, if there's a listener out there and you're listening to this and like, hey, there's this already out here, please, please send me a note because I, I don't, Mahesh, am I wrong? I, I don't know of where to go to find that if I'm an architect. Yeah. And you're bringing up a good point. This is why. At EOGBC, I announced this program called Better Materials so that we can give a centralized catalog of all materials used by products around the world. Now, I understand why an architect doesn't want to share or a construction leader doesn't want to share that list because it's their, what I call USP, it's their IP to an extent, right? But but, okay. but that's understandable. But however, that for the broader good, we can put that in a broader platform that people can have an indication saying, look, this product has got all the right documentation it is already verified for compliance with lead or verified for compliance with well, whatever that is, so that the search process itself eliminates all that back and forth that you need to do to basically get to that stage. Now, let me let me give a shout out here for a platform that you know I, I at least I I have a great here we go. For. Let's hear it. It's called Ecomedes, E C O E C O M E D E S, and when you look at Ecomedes. Ecomedes has got a ton of materials that has been demonstrated to be compliant with many, many multiple standards. Now, one of the goals was to basically work in that platform, with that platform and similar platforms and create a unified interface for people to be able to go and actually do a Google type search and see that whether that material exists, if it exists, whether it is verified for XYZ certification, and then what are the associated documentation. You know, this is the place where we try to start and build and that organization is doing good work. And of course, they can do much more, but that needs everybody cooperating and collaborating because it's very funny that everybody's searching for those materials, but nobody would make the effort to make it available for somebody else. So I'm going to say for somebody sharing. Else. Isn't that interesting? Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I find that if we really, like after Google, we should be doing a better job, right? If Google had thought that we will never allow information to be found, then none of us would be happy today. You know, we are all happy with Google. So it, it's just a, it's it's something that really really surprises me. But I do plan to spend a lot of time in that space. Just since you asked, Global Network for Zero will be taking a significant lead in the coming months, or probably in the coming coming weeks, I should say, to rightly really think about materials and products, carbon footprint and zero emission products and whatnot. Because that remains one of my passion, a particularly a problem that other people have not solved well. So I'd like to attempt attempt on it if that makes sense. I love that. Mahesh, this has been awesome. And thank you for sharing a couple of these links too. I'll make sure we link to them in the show notes. If someone wants to connect with you or reach out, what's the best way for them to do that? I think the best way to do it is to connect through my Twitter, my LinkedIn, and most importantly, Instagram. Everything is available. But uh, also please contact us through Global Network for Zero through our info page. We will uh, review and respond. Although we are a small team, and we have a big network and we have good connections that we can bring it forward and we will learn and educate each other. Excellent. Mahesh, th again, thank you so much for coming to the show. And for our listeners, if you enjoyed this podcast, make sure you check us out at venvio.com slash podcast to subscribe and get more. Until next time, I'm Zach Williams. Thanks, everybody.